Hi everybody, uh, you've, you've had my intro, so I'm not going to even do it. I'm, I'm Moana. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to edit my <laughs> intro a little bit. Okay. So, I was a VR, AR producer as of last week, <laughs> and from next Monday, I am the new Game Runner producer person at Starcold. Yay! Yay. Congrats. Um, so, yeah, in university for game art and design, I try to focus all of my personal research papers um, on ways that games could improve society in general. Yeah, cool. And that's what I did too. Yeah. <laughs> well, we both did. <laughs> so we're kind of collaborating today because we, we were kind of talking about similar things. Um, uh, and our end goals are the same. You must construct additional feelings. Or at least we hope our players will. Um, and no spoilers on Endgame. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I haven't seen it yet. Tomorrow. No, Sunday morning. Um, our end game is all about leveraging games to make our communities better. So we're each going to present a framework which is designed to unlock empathy and altruism. Um, and hopefully, you'll be able to see how easy it is and how you can apply these steps to your games. Yay. <laughs> Cool, so my part is um, all about how, um, as you know, like our, to our gaming community can be really toxic at times. But can we improve it through games themselves by showing players what it's like to live in someone else's shoes? You can click the button for me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so films have proven that elevating people to be kinder in their real lives is actually possible. So I want to discuss the discoveries from film and other media and how we can bring them into games. Cool. So I'm going to get started. As I was saying, we all know about some of the really toxic stuff that goes on in our gaming community, harassment, Gamergate, doxing, abuse. All these things sour our community. And they can make a lot of people feel really unsafe or uncomfortable. But where does all of this vitriol actually come from? At its base level, a lot of it comes down to fear. And to quote from our buddy Yoda for the second time today, uh, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. And hate leads to suffering. And we've all seen recently how much suffering can come from hate. But what are all these people so afraid of? What, that diversity in games is somehow going to ruin games? But how? When you dig into this stuff, it's often pretty incoherent. And there's some interesting stuff in there around power and patriarchy and things like that. But a huge part of it actually stems from a fear of the unknown and a lack of understanding about what that unknown might be. The other is a term we use a lot in anthropology, and many of you may have struck it before. It's about how I am me, and I know my world. I know my perspectives. My friends are like me, my family are like me, sometimes my colleagues, even my neighbors. We share common ground. We share common perspectives. But over there is the other. They're not like me. They have a different culture, a different religion, maybe a different gender, sexuality, ability. All these things mean that they have a different world view, different perspectives, different motivations, and I don't know what they are. That is the fear, a lack of understanding of what's going on in another person's world. You don't know what they're going to do, what they're thinking, what offends them, what makes them angry. That not knowing is a very scary thing for how humans relate to each other. So reflecting on this, when I was doing my master's research, I asked the question, is there a way to fix it? Is there a way to address this lack of understanding within the gaming context? Can games themselves be one of the ways that we bridge this divide? And the short answer is yes. The slightly longer answer is mm -hmm. <laughs> all this talk of fate, of fear and hate and suffering can be a bit intimidating, but breaking this stuff down is actually really helpful because it shows us that if one of the problems is that people are afraid of the unknown, then all we have to do is make some things known. We have to open the Pandora's box and show that inside is just ordinary people trying to live good lives and enjoy games. No conspiracies and no plots. 
So how do we open the box? How do we dispel fear? How do we allow a person through a game to learn about another person's way of life? To, of their challenges, of their fears, their culture or ways of doing things? And how do we do it in a way that stimulates the player into having empathy for those experiences and perspectives? So my master, in my master's research, I developed this whole set of guidelines, and we're not going to go into all of them today. Um, but I will do a really quick summary to kind of give you a context, and then we're going to focus on a few of them that directly relate to the kind of empathy question. Um, and then it will give a springboard for what Calliope is going to talk to you about, which is kind of even more of the fun stuff around how we make these experiences linger and affect people outside the game. So just in brief, um, the first one is fun first. It's about not letting your social issue take over the game experience. And just for context, what I mean by that is these guidelines are not developed for educational games, and they're not developed for games about a social problem. They're designed for mainstream games. So it's about making sure that you don't let your social issue um, distract people from having a fun time playing a video game. The next one is about showing examples. It's about putting stuff in your game that develops a context and shows how inequality occurs and the negative effects of it. Next is normalization and representation. So normalize diverse representation. Um, fill your story, story with diverse characters, their stories and perspectives. Next is positive end game, not an Avengers reference. In the battle versus injustice, let the player win, at least some of the time. Next comes consider social context. So consider what the story means within wider social themes and context, which is about things like don't have your black male lead getting shot at the end of the game because you haven't done good representation if he gets shot. Like, yeah. Um, Immersion is about immersing your players in many different ways because these things are more effective if people are deeply immersed. Next is embodiment, and that's about making your player feel present in the game world by playing as the character that some of this stuff is happening to. Sociality is about helping people play your game together because people come back to games more often if they're playing with um, their friends. And choice is about giving players the power to choose. Cho choice helps players feel involved and personally responsible for the narrative and the characters. And then game styles is just about being aware of the fact that, as all of you probably know, that different people play games for different reasons. And so you've got to think about different styles of gamers. And we're going to focus on this side, because they make the example delivery framework, which is a terrible name, but there you go. Um, so in the context of a game where the player is immersed in the game, they're making choices which affect the outcomes, and they're embodied by the characters, the EDF is a tool for ways to inspire empathy, inform, empower, and break down stereotypes for players. So the concept behind it is that this framework allows you to put examples into your game of both negative and positive things happening, which help to dispel the fear of the unknown. So let me take you through each part of the framework and show you examples of the examples. Mm -hmm. And just feel free to have a wiggle if you want, because I feel like we've all been sitting still for a really long time. I'm going to have a wiggle, even if you're not. <laughs> OK, so we start out with some guiding principles. They inform the EDF so that we don't derail the game experience. The first is fun first, as I was just telling you guys. We don't want the examples to become the main focus of the game. We don't want it to be a distraction or detraction for people who might be resistant to playing a game based on reducing intolerant attitudes and behaviors. What I mean by that is if someone's sitting down to play Overwatch, they're not there to play an educational game. They don't want all the social stuff to distract them from playing a shooter game. But it's good that it is there anyway. It's good that there's queer representation and diverse ethnicities and genders in that game. But we've got a good balance there because it doesn't affect your ability to play a shooter game. We also want players to come away from the experience feeling empowered and with more resources for dealing with things that have been unfamiliar rather than just feeling bummed out. So in general, not always, but in general, we want it to be a positive experience 
There's a big argument about having negative games, and I don't want to get into it, but for this framework, we say that we want it to be a positive one. And then, there we go. So, type one is showing how intolerance occurs, and it's shown through examples of intolerance, i.e. sexism, actively happening within the game story and happening to the main character that you're playing as. Sorry, I realize you just have to stand here while I talk for 20 minutes. I mean, there's a chair. <laughs> Are you good? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. Um, happening to the character you're playing as, and keeping in mind our principles of not distracting the player, in general, it's very useful to use microaggressions in the narrative to do this. And what the heck do I mean by that? Well, let's watch this little gif that I made <laughs> an RPG maker, because I can. Okay, so here we've got a microaggression. Aggression. It's, a, it's a little moment where the blonde character comes up to the blue-haired character and says, hey, wouldn't you, like, I think you'd look real cute in a dress. And they're like, well, it's, it's good, man. <laughs> this kind of replicates the situation I had in real life where someone was like, hey, I got you makeup for your birthday because I thought you mustn't have any. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like... <laughs> 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 Microaggressions are a comment or action that subtly and often unconsciously or unintentionally expresses a prejudiced attitude towards a member of a marginalized group. I wasn't marginalized because I wasn't wearing makeup, but the point is microaggressions are a great way to in introduce injustice in a game for a couple of reasons, and one is they're actually how a lot of people personally experience intolerance. For a lot of people, it's these small but irritating moments that show that the way that you are isn't accepted by society, which grate and wear you down on, over time. And the second reason is that, as per our principles, they're a great way of allowing the player to feel those moments of intolerance without having a huge neon arrow that's pointing to the moment saying, hey, injustice! <laughs> um, uh, here we have a moment of microaggression that's um, isolated, but typically what you want to do in a full game is to sprinkle these moments amongst all the other stuff that's going on so that it becomes like a note which plays through the, um, the game, through the character, and through the player's experiences. Macroaggressions <coughs> are overt where <laughs> microaggressions are covert. And <laughs> yeah, rude, eh? And yeah, she kicks through there. It's hard to tell because it's pixels, but there you go. So, um, macroaggressions are overt expressions of manifested aggression directed towards individuals from or an entire marginalized social group. Their manifested violence, such as bullying, violent attacks, murders, and an extreme genocide. And usually it comes from a bit of microaggressions. Using macroaggressions in your game can be very useful, but it's something you want to do with a light hand. It's very obvious, um, and so, you don't, so you'll want to have a context and a reason for why it's happening. Am I really that massively over time, or is that wrong? It's, you just keep going. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the point of both of these examples is to frustrate the player. It's to have them annoyed by an experience, to hamper them in some small way, and to illustrate that the way they are being treated isn't fair. The step, the step is to both show them what social intolerance looks like and to have them experience it as the character. So in the moment, it's partially directed at them. Oh, yeah, so they, the clock's correct and the time on the speech is not. So you're, they, the one the that you're clock? freaking out about. That's, okay, that's, that is not correct. Yeah. I haven't been talking for like five minutes. No, okay. not at all. <laughs> so I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so the next one is showing the negative effects of intolerance. And this is shown through causal examples in how intolerance, has, uh, intolerance events have resulted in negative emotions, decisions, or behavior patterns in the characters. So this gift crashed, so you just get a, a, a single image from it, but they're sad. The blue character is sad about this, the situation. So it's about showing consequences. 
We stimulate empathy in the player in type one by making them play through the character experiencing intolerance, and then we follow it up at some point where it's appropriate um, with the character's emotional reaction to those experiences. It's not always sadness, it's sometimes anger, frustration, fear. It can manifest as the character giving up on relationships in their lives or making life decisions based on those negative experiences. The empathy and educational moment here is to illustrate that experiencing intolerance does have a negative effect on people. And we want the player, as they're living through the character, to feel even some of that negative emotion. <coughs> so that they get an experience of this thing that happens. It hurts. So next is normalization. And it's shown through diverse characters and stories being present in a game and their experiences being validated, their perspectives being presented as mundane or ordinary to some degree. So normalization is one of the easiest steps to take as a game dev and we've all thankfully seen this done and often done reasonably well, such as the example of queer characters in Overwatch. Normalization is achieved by taking a non-stereotypical character or storyline and having it in your game in a way which allows that thing to become less weird for the user who has until then maybe not seen it much or sometimes not at all. Like if we had a game where the American president was a Native American woman, and it just kind of was accepted that that was a reasonable thing to happen, and it should be. Um, or if the next Grand Theft Auto was set in Cape Town, and there was an African context to that story. Um, or even by letting us see more depth in characters that are a trope, like when we get to see that gritty, tough guy character having emotional struggles or being a great dad. Uh, normalization is about stripping away the fear and showing that it's okay to be something outside of the stereotypes that we see in media. It's also a great tool narratively because while you can address it directly, like for example in Dragon Age they have a trans male character who if you ask him he will talk about his experiences and bring up things like wearing a binder, or um, uh, or you can have normalization just work th through making something a non-issue. So like in Mass Effect, you can play Shepard as either male or female, and the story is basically exactly the same, irrespective of your, of your choice. It doesn't become about Shepard being a woman, but through her being there, it makes having complex female leads in action games more normal. Next is victory and resistance. <laughs> is all this intolerance making you feel depressed yet? Yeah, well, me too, and same for blue. <laughs> the final example is about letting the player win against intolerance once in a while. Not every single time, but it's a video game. It doesn't have to be as depressing as the real world. Now, this doesn't always have to be through yeeting a sexist guard, but sometimes resistance can be in the form of something like an emotional victory, such as choosing not to be emotionally manipulated by someone, or choosing to follow a passion despite peer pressure. Whatever the shape it takes, resistance and victory allows the player to feel empowered to fight intolerance. And we want them to walk away feeling empowered and not helpless. So, just to sum up what we've done, the four types, and you don't have to use all of them in a game, just keep that in mind, are type one, showing how intolerance occurs. Type two is showing negative effects of intolerance. Then we have normalization of stereotypical perspective, non-stereotypical perspectives. <laughs> Just use all the stereotypes. Uh, and victory and resistance. <clears throat> this example framework gives the player a unique ability to play a day in the shoes of someone different to them, to learn about a different life, different challenges, experience the frustrations and hurts of intolerance, and be given tools to overcome the fear of the unknown. So I hope that that is useful for you guys if you're thinking about trying to do that with your games. Have a thing with a button, you need to press this guy. And that's right. a laser. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Um, so, more frameworks, let's go. Um, putting it into practice. So we've discussed how games can show us different perspectives and life views. 
So what I really wanted to find out in, in my research, my humble research, um, was can they actually inspire us to change the way that we interact with people in the real world? Probably. So, moral elevation. In order to talk about how we improve empathy and invoke empathy in the real world, we need to talk about a thing called moral elevation. I will try and keep this part short and we can get onto the game a bit soon. Um, the term moral elevation is actually a pretty recent one. It was only coined in 2000 by a man called Jonathan Haidt, with a D. Um, it's described as the exact opposite emotion to disgust. So we have an extremely negative reaction to things that we find disgusting. Um, this can be anything from writing food to a person or an act that we find really morally corrupt. Um, disgust, like a lot of emotions, is actually designed to just keep us safe. Um, it teaches us to avoid things that could hurt us or make us sick. Um, and other times it's to keep us safe from being excluded. Moral elevation is an extremely positive reaction that to seeing something so very altruistic and selfless that it draws us in. We want to be more like the person that we saw doing something selfless. It encourages us to do better. So, when does it happen? Um, old mate Jonathan Haidt um, began to study how watching someone do something altruistic would change people's behavior and their perception of others. So he specifically noted that people are not just inspired by witnessing altruism, but they actually adjust their behavior to become more like the person that they saw doing it. An example um, is a woman who was more attracted to her male friend, um, actually attracted from zero, <laughs> Um, after he skipped down and getting dropped home so that he could help an old lady shovel snow out of her driveway. Another man was so moved by the way that the community rallied around his sick father when he was a kid that it actually like, gave him the energy he needed to pursue being a doctor and go and help others as well. So, turns out this effect isn't just relegated to the real world though. Engineering it. <laughs> so, um, trigger warning for cancer. Uh, if, you, if this is going to be distressing to you, you may absolutely leave. Okay. How do we shift this phenomenon to media? In 2015, researcher Paul J. Zach created a study for a morally elevating experience with a video clip of a man describing his last few months with his terminally ill son. He, and it was actually quite popular at the time as well. You pro, like a lot of you may have seen a New York article on it or something like that. Um, he noticed that the format of the story made a really big difference in the way that the audience reacted. So people donated a lot more money after seeing a very personal video clip than if they'd just read the same scenario in a factual news like matter. Um, it's because of the story element, and in particular, the structure of the narrative arc. More on that. So, Zach had discovered that he had a much easier time getting people to adjust their behavior, which in this case, the metric was donating money, um, when they were watching visual media. So that was like the first step, was, okay, visual media is better than written. Even a word-for-word -word account of the, of the same like, clip, but in a written format, um, didn't have as much of an impact as watching a little clip. So, stimulus is really important. While it's true that the brain can't necessarily differentiate between reading an account and experiencing something, this relies on the skill of the writer <laughs> to be really good and transport us there. Um, whereas games are really great because they provide all that imagery for you. And that's what we really need. It like, helps us ease into that moral elevation and that transportative state straight away. So this, is allow this also allows us to talk about what's known as the assumption of the protagonist. And that's because when we talk about our experiences in games, we don't say, my character was attacked by someone else's character. Um, we say, I was attacked, or I found an item. You know, you, you own it. Oops, that's right, I've got my mic there. <laughs> um, so we don't separate ourselves from the characters that we play when we're in game. A actual game study by Yuna Vargas showed us that players who use a hero avatar in a game are more likely to present with pro-social behavior after playing than those who played a villain. In this case, it was the option of giving a blindfolded stranger chili or chocolate after they played a game. Hero players feel good doing things that make other people feel good. They take on a bit of the persona of the character that they play. And I wasn't going to add this, but I am going to. Um, interestingly, hero players are more likely to give chocolate rather than chili, but there isn't actually any conclusive proof that villain players are more likely to give chili than they were before they played the game. So there's plenty of studies that refute the concept that video game violence leads to antisocial behavior, and that's like another topic than this one, but the good news is it looks like the pro-social side actually has much more of an impact. 
oh, this is a, this is a diagram. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit nervous about this slide because there's so many writers here. <laughs> Um, so, why did the narrative arc change the reaction if the content's all the same? Um, it's all about creating a structure that focuses us and holds our attention. I'm not a narrative designer, and um, there's plenty of you here, so easy. <laughs> but I want to give the rest of us a kind of quick overview of Freytag's classic diagram, classic narrative pyramid. And it's important to us to know that this is a traditionally Western-centric view of how narratives should play out and resolve. Um, and for the purpose of moral elevation, it works pretty well. So, more content on the page. So the narrative arc is important to us because when we're trying to invoke altruism, we can plot the tension. Tension's important because it's when we have the most of this attention chemical in our system called uh, ATCH. Um, <laughs> it's been proven that people who, are, who have more of this in their system of this hormone that I can't pronounce, um, in this system are more likely to be inspired and therefore they're more likely to be morally elevated to do better outside of the game. Peak tension brings me to my next point. The duality of attention. So, the negative, I mean they're both, it, it, all, it is what it is, but there's negative and positive. Uh, so the negative, the cortisol, it's what I'm feeling right now. <laughs> Very distressed. <laughs> you don't get I'm very distressed. <laughs> You're doing great. Um, attention focus. I am very focused right now. Um, problem solving and tension. The positive associated chemical is oxytocin. It's a bit of a superstar. We've probably all heard of that one. Other praising, motivational, uplifting, future building. So even though we're trying to create a positive change in people, we, it doesn't mean that it should be all feel good stuff, as you said. Um, so it's important to show the plight of others in order for the good deed to have the necessary impact so that you feel like you need to do something afterwards. Full attention is rarely grabbed by something that doesn't invoke some level of distress and tension and negative emotions capture us. <coughs> Positive ones show us where to channel it, so we need both. More duality of attention. So this slide is more about the physical and biological breakdown. So we have two important systems, our sympathetic and our parasympathetic nervous systems, which I always get them mixed up because I feel like the sympathetic one should be the nice, resting, soothing one, but it's the stress one. Um, so researchers Piper, Satin, and Saslow found that both of our soothing, resting system and our stress-reactive fight-or-flight system um, were activated at peak emotional points in these narratives that were intended to create moral elevation. I should say intended to morally elevate. Um, so together, these refer to what is commonly referred to as before as positive and negative biological reactions. Not many things invoke both of these systems at the same time. Um, so moral elevation is actually an outlier and it kind of confused researchers because of that reason. Um, we have to feel distressed by the plight of another, but also have all of the feel goods going on to then want to do something about it. As a caveat, please do not intentionally harm your player or traumatize them. Um, you don't need to do that to get them to show empathy. Having said that, we're actually extremely accustomed to transportative distress. Like, you know, we've all cried when a dog dies in a film or when you're watching a really emotional TED talk or when your friend tells you a story that's really sad. And exposure to tragedy, as in like tragedies and drama, um, has actually been accredited with higher pro-social health, psychological health, and behaviours in other areas, specifically in helping us emotionally regulate and process. So, you know, just, it's a balance. This one's really easy. Designing for empathy and moral elevation means that the conflict and tension in your scenario should be focused around the value that you're trying to engage the player in. Don't make your conflict about climate change if you're trying to inspire your player to volunteer at soup kitchens. Make it unexpected. It has been proven that moral elevation and morally elevating media has more of an effect when we're not expecting it or it's extraordinary. This means that just general politeness won't cut it, you know, like saying thank you as you pick up some groceries and it goes straight over your head, you don't even notice it. It's got to be something that in a moment of high tension inspires us and captures us and then makes us want to be extraordinary. I keep touching my chest. Okay, where's the framework? All right, all right, let's get on to some checklists. Here we go, your second checklist. So, you need, well, there's lots of ways to increase empathy and moral elevation, but my one is you need a narrative arc with a climax at your peak tension learning point. 
you need duality, so you need both those systems, both cortisol and oxytocin. You get the idea. Empathy is a goal, not necessarily a mechanic. It doesn't, you don't have to have a mechanic that encourages the player to, as a classic one, hold hands or anything like that to involve empathy in your game. Altruistic engagement behavior is an option, but not required, e.g. the player doesn't necessarily have to be the one doing the hero stuff. They can just be watching someone else do it. Align your situation with your values, as I said before, and make sure it's surprising and unexpected in the setting. Sometimes a thank you could be actually really surprising and unexpected in the setting, but yeah, be aware of that. And this kind of thing should hopefully copy paste to a bunch of situations. Um, I will try and do that in this slide. <laughs> so fair warning, I made this up very quickly. It's a bit silly, but you get the idea. So imagine we're playing a game. Um, it's a first person RPG, you're a gang member, you feel like a badass, you are a badass. This is an example of a small narrative arc within a game rather than the overarching narrative because you don't need that. So, you've been introduced to two rough gang NPCs and they're your mates. Let's call them Abel and Ben just because it's more interesting than A and B. You accept their invitation and join them to hunt down another member of a gang who still something that was belonging to Abel. You feel powerful and like you can help make a difference in this world, so it really gives you a lot of onus and agency. So you join in the right of the back seat of the car and you listen to the conversation of the two in front. Abel and Ben identify the guy that they're hunting and a car chase ensues. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> Abel is driving really recklessly as you get closer and the tension's slowly rising. Is your rise in action? <laughs> um, Abel suddenly screams, sorry, Ben suddenly screams at Abel to stop. Abel slams in the brakes. This is the second time this meme has been used. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in danger. <laughs> um, ben shouts that he's seen something on the road. They both jump out of the car. So at that point, you have the option to follow them and see what they're doing, or you can stay in the car, which is kind of this, your safe zone. So from either inside the car or out in the street, depending on where the player decides to go, you can see Ben chase a cat away from a baby squirrel that it was about to pounce on. Oh. Um, Abel gently picks up the squirrel and Ben tries to shoo the cat away. You can either choose to help Ben chase the cat or you can follow Abel to aid him in finding the mother squirrel. Just keep doing it. There you go. It did that to me too. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> um, so I actually can't scroll that way. Can I scroll down? Scroll but backwards. Oh, down on your notes. No, oh, I've got a lot of notes here because I wasn't. Anyway, we'll make it the rest. So basically, after this. There you go. The magic person in the wings. Has Thank done it you. For you. <laughs> <laughs> so Abel successfully finds some other squirrel who retrieves it. The squirrel scurry away. That's all the feel goods. Ben successfully chases the cat away. You can still be in the car observing, and you would probably be going, "What? Did, what did I just witness? What just happened?" Um, or you can join in. And that is your, please, thank you, <laughs> Dan, you mom. So that's your resolution. So everything, so the little sequence was like a very insular sequence. That's all finished. You can either, you can return to the game. Everything is like, the car chase was disrupted. Everything is sort of as it was at the beginning of that sequence. Now, I realize that from a player's perspective, like this could be quite annoying. Um, if, if it, like, it disrupts your flow, but there's lots of ways to work this kind of thing in where it's not disruptive or irritating in any way. So, what did I do just then? I chose a low risk example that didn't involve heavy social issues in this case. I eliminated triggering topics and I made it really accessible because everyone loves animals. Hypothetically, this kind of scenario could also apply to anything that a developer would want to create. Two, these are gang dudes. You weren't expecting that. You're not expecting random kindness towards baby squirrels. So we took that one off. Three, we applied the narrative arc. Thank you, Zach. And four, the resolution will, live, will leave us with good feels, even if it wasn't an important part of the story. Like if that was just a part where we just cut that car chase off to give you a little bit more framework to then go and do something else to find that guy, it's fine, it works. The idea is that you can work this in anywhere, you just need to be thoughtful. Does this work on everyone? Kind of. Um, it's interesting. So not everyone is as susceptible, though almost all of us are to some degree. Um, people definitely react stronger um, and less so in these studies. What they found is that people who identify with a higher moral um, 
value of themselves and identity, higher moral identity, were more likely to engage post um, watching elevating media because that was what they found important about themselves. Um, in terms of a binary gender scale, women were more likely to have a stronger moral identity than men. Um, and people who had an oxytocin, oxytocin deficient disorder were among the very few people who didn't have any reaction. No matter, and they won't, no matter how compelling or great your five point narrative is. We have a big audience. There's a lot of gamers, there's a lot of people that we can aspire to be kinder. I think we've shown you that with stuff, there's, it's really easy to work this stuff into your games. Um, and it'd be great that we could inspire even a tiny percentage of that to show your empathy. Go forth and elevate. You have recipes now. <laughs> Do you want to come in on this? Cool. Um, da -da 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 -da. We have a responsibility as developers to keep the impact of our games in mind as we create. We have the opportunity to make a better world with our games. So hopefully this talk even though we've kind of kind of approached it in slightly different ways, it's shown you that there's really usable tools to make our community better through the games that we create. You don't need to make a serious game or an educational game in order for this to, in order to put some good in the world and for this to have an impact. Um, so yeah, keeping some of this, these principles and studies in mind hopefully won't derail your game or take away any of the fun. Um, so I really hope you found this helpful. We hope you found this helpful. Um, the material is all available online or you can contact us if you want some more references because I've got a whole lot. Yeah. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for listening. Yeah, thanks guys. <laughs>